today we are going to discuss the challenge of wellness in human life. If you look at human history, we notice that from antiquity there has been continuous search for good life. What is good life? How one can lead good life has been a perennial question. If you recollect, you will find that Lord Buddha started his journey with the quest for understanding the challenges in life. He found that there is misery everywhere and how this misery can be removed was the main concern in his analysis and Buddhism started with this question. We also notice that in Vedic period, there was a desire to live a long life, a life with dignity, a life which is rich in terms of pursuing various goals. In recent years, psychologists have shown interest in themes like happiness, well-being, and a whole new field has emerged with the title of positive psychology. In particular, the 21st century has been marked by the search for alternative ways to organize life and to see the implications of thinking, acting and relating in positive ways. If you look at the history of psychology, you will notice that the 20th century was largely preoccupied with negative emotions like anxiety, depression and stress and that has provided insights about the kind of difficulties people have. Today, psychological thought has moved in the direction of looking at what are the possibilities and potentials in human beings. Positive psychology tries to identify the various strengths which are present in a person, how those strengths can be nurtured. In this context, today's discussion would like to focus on the notion of wellness. Here, we would like to bring in insights from contemporary psychology as well as what kind of insight is available from Indian thought systems. The three important features of today's discussion are the nature and dimensions of wellness, what is the Indian perspective on wellness and how wellness can be nurtured. Let us begin with an important quote from Durkheim. He noted long back towards the end of 19th century, but in fact is it true that the happiness of the individual increases as man advances, nothing is more doubtful. His observation shows that the kind of progress that we have made and the kind of changes that are happening in our life are not unambiguously positive and with modernity, with industrialization, with technological development, there is equal amount of growth in pathology and we notice that in developed countries, there is increasing problem of depression, anxiety and drug addiction. It requires our attention and it requires an analysis of the causes of such kind of changes and it also requires efforts to ameliorate the suffering. Let me share an interesting trend in terms of the relationship between the economic development and life satisfaction. Here we find that 
there is increase in GDP, there is increase in income, but the lower dotted line which shows the pattern of life satisfaction and it is intriguing that life satisfaction remains almost constant and increase in income is almost linear. So, across this time period life satisfaction is remaining same, but the economic growth is at higher level. Now, there is a gap and this gap creates a challenge. The challenge is that why it is so that people are not happy while they have high income? What are the causes of this discrepancy? How we can get rid of those causes and bring in happiness in life and achieve the goal of pursuing good life? Let us uh, think about the notion of wellness because in order to understand the causes and developing strategies to live a life where wellness is present, we need to understand the nature of wellness itself. Wellness is a positive and sustainable condition that allows thriving and flourishing. It embraces mind, body, society and environment. What is important to recognize in this presentation is that wellness is not limited to individual. Wellness is situated in the context. At the same time, it is a positive condition and it is a condition that can be maintained and it is a condition that helps people to grow, develop and flourish. In the Indian tradition, there is a notion of swastha, which literally means autolocus. A person who enjoys harmonious interplay of cognition and affect rather than being subjugated to them. A person who has control over his own self. There is another important interesting idea that comes from the great uh, uh, medicine man from India who was the first surgeon perhaps Shushrut and the idea is that a kind of balanced state appears to be the right kind of lifestyle, the right kind of arrangement in relation to the environment and functioning of individual's life. I would like to bring this point before you, samadosha, samagnishcha, samadhatu malakriya. Now, this word sam means balance. If everything is in right proportion, if it is in a balanced state, then you enjoy a state of happiness and wellness. There is another statement which tells Prasannatmendriya mana swastha ityavidhiyate. What is the meaning of this? It says atma, indriya, and man, that is the soul or higher consciousness, the sensory organs, and mind. When all these maintain a state of pleasure, when all of them are in a condition where they feel delight, then there is a feeling of happiness. So, the point is that happiness is a notion or wellness is a notion which is more comprehensive, which goes beyond the sensory pleasure, which relates to mind, which relates to association of human being with the larger existence or higher consciousness. Now, I would like to bring home the point that uh, in the course of psychological studies, 
researchers have tried to understand the nature of happiness and they have come forward with some important insights. Here we find so those lessons that are now available with us, they indicate certain kinds of correlates of uh, happiness. Search for happiness through hedonistic pursuit has limitations. It has been noted that happiness has a hedonistic view and also an eudynamic view. The happiness which, rela which relates to material goals, pursuit of worldly pleasure, having more and more possessions has certain limitations. Those efforts which are directed to attainment of broader goals, goals for ecology, goals for society and goals to relate to one's soul provide a different perspective and a complete state of happiness involves both kinds of concerns. The analysis of the causes of unhappiness is insufficient. It is very important to realize that uh, the effort to compensate for unhappiness in terms of therapy, in terms of counseling is not sufficient. Why I want to emphasize this point is that a lot of concern of psychologist has been to identify the nature of depression, anxiety and stress and to create mechanisms to alleviate that, to reduce that. Now, that kind of approach is incomplete and insufficient. We need to find out the nature of the positive state, positive thinking, positive behavior, positive relationship and how they can be nurtured and maintained that has become the agenda of positive psychology. There is also a kind of uh, realization that positive and negative effect are two different dimensions. The fact that a person has positive effect does not mean that there is no negative effect. There have been many studies which indicate that these are two separate dimensions and they need to be assessed differently through different measures. It is not that one's presence means absence of the other. There is another interesting finding which I would like to share with you and that relates to the association between happiness and success. The kind of uh, prevailing notion in society is that one, when one has success, then one gets happiness. Now, there is research that indicates that happiness leads to success and in order to achieve success, you need to do things where you experience happiness. Happiness contributes to growth, development and achievement. The kind of momentary association that we find between success and happiness is problematic. We will come to this point later. There is another series of studies which indicate that self-esteem which was considered to be an important variable is now being looked at with some kind of questioning and it is being examined that if there is high self esteem or very high self esteem, it is going to contribute negatively to the growth of individual. The emphasis on egoic states is creating more disturbance in the life of people. The emphasis on this kind of self which relates to the materialistic goals, possession of various things has certain limitations. 
and these points have been elaborated in our discussion on the notion of self. So, here it is sufficient to emphasize that one needs to take care of other aspects of self which relate to society and consciousness. When we think about good life, a life which is satisfying, a life worth pursuing, then we need to examine its component. When this question is posed to any individual that please tell what is your idea of good life, then there are some concerns which become very obvious. One is that we evaluate the condition in life, the attainments, the relationship with goals, the future that we envision. So, this evaluation is one concern when we think about good life. We also focus on the activities and goals and attainments in relation to the individual. Then there is another concern which is very serious that people think about the goals in life, the final goal in life what we really want to achieve. I would like to bring home this point that the kind of goals which are pursued are quite varied. Life itself is considered to be an instrument to achieve certain higher goals. Those goals are considered as values. In Indian thought, there is a very clear emphasis on pursuing dharma, artha, kama and moksha as four important goals they are known as purusharthas. Out of these four, the first one dharma is a kind of mechanism or a central principle which maintains the relationship of individual with the ecology in which the person lives. Now, it is basic principle, kama satisfaction of various desires and pursuing various activities. Artha pertains to the uh, professional activities and also acquiring various kinds of positions. So, there is no denial of pursuing for prosperity or seeking wealth. There is no denial of fulfilling desires, but both have to be performed within the framework of dharma. So, a life worth pursuing has to emphasize all these goals dharma, artha, kama and moksha. It is not one goal which is important, it is a balance of goals across these four kinds of pursuits which are relevant. If uh, we look at the various theories which have been proposed to explain happiness and well-being, we find some interesting propositions and here I have listed some of the major perspectives which have been proposed. One considers an approach which is hedonistic that seeking positive goals and avoiding negative things. This is one of the major perspectives which has guided research in psychology for a long time in many areas. Then it is also argued that pursuit of wellness involves desire fulfillment, but there is no end to that list and it is very difficult to satisfy all the desires, they increase and they increase. Then there is another approach which tries to uh, create an objective list and then you can determine that well, if you are able to satisfy uh, one's attainment in relation to 
the items which are listed in that, then you can feel uh, happy, you can feel well being and you can move forward in life. Then there is another aspect which brings the notion of wellness at cognitive level or at attitudinal level and then it becomes a mental state, it deals with certain kinds of moods or it also refers to a hybrid notion where moods as well as attitudes both are included. Now, people often think in their life, common man also thinks about the notion of happiness and well being. There are several studies which have tried to interview people and they have tried to find out what are the things which matter in the life of the people and what are the things which are considered relevant to the pursuit of well being. Here we have some of the key concerns that have emerged from the study of lay people. Authenticity that uh, if you live a life where you are able to express yourself authentically, pursue your goals authentically, then it is a life worth living. Significance of effect is central. If you live in society, if you get the uh, appreciation, if you get love from others, then you enjoy life and you feel that there is well being. An active life and participation in different activities is another component which has been uh, considered relevant to happy life. Efficacy and vitality that you are living a life which is vibrant, which is full of uh, involvement that indicates the state of well being. Good spirit, creativity, experiencing fulfillment and resilience. So, the list which is presented here focuses on individuals growth, individuals involvement and individuals movement in the life of space. These are the things which are central to the experience of well being. We have also studies which have tried to analyze in experimental as well as in field settings the antecedents of wellness, how people make judgment of wellness and what are the antecedents which determine wellness of an individual. Psychological research has shown that mental strength, certain personality traits, the advantages which people enjoy, the achievement when people get something of, uh, when people achieve their goals, when they for example, uh, do better in examination or when they do something uh, more uh, uh, prominently as compared to other individuals, in those moments they do feel well being. Freedom in life and work is another feature that uh, when you are able to pursue goals according to your choice, then perhaps you feel well being social support and esteem is another component, security, optimism and commitment also figure in the list of antecedents. Here what we notice is that antecedents of wellness include those features of life where growth of an individual is recognized. In all those notions that we have seen here in terms of antecedents, there is emphasis on activity, future orientation, satisfaction and relating to task 
and the life circumstances and in effective way. These are the features which are present when we think about the perceived causes of wellness. Now, there have been many analyses by scholars, thinkers, philosophers and psychologists about the general condition that prevails today. These realizations indicate that in general we are still not happy some of the time and some people are unhappy most of the time. There are individual variations, there are group variations in the experience of happiness and well being. But there is a psychological difficulty in organizing our life. Because of habituation and adaptation to pleasurable situations, what gives pleasure and happiness at one point of time becomes less pleasurable and provides less degree of happiness and this changes the whole scenario. Then there is another important feature that when we compare with others, we always find that there is some kind of gap between the other person and myself. Now, an individual who compares with others, he compares with one who is at a higher level and there is always a possibility that the person feels deprived, disadvantaged or at a lower level of attainment as compared to that person. So, this kind of gap leads to frustration and it, it, it is always present irrespective of the level of income. The person compares with the other person or group and feels deprived. Then there is another uh, interesting observation by various uh, uh, researchers that when we lose something, then our affective reaction is stronger. When we gain something, then the reaction is not so strong. If someone loses a note of 50 rupees, then the feeling, the negative feeling is stronger than one, when one gets a note of 50 rupees. So, our reaction, the affective reaction is different, the, the magnitude or strength of reaction is different under both the conditions. So, we feel more loss uh, and uh, gain is responded to less effectively. Then there are adaptive, but distressing emotions. As I have mentioned earlier, anxiety, depression and anger are such negative emotions. They help in certain conditions. For example, anger is important to uh, provide security. Anger is also important to organize our relationship with others in certain circumstances, but it also creates certain kinds of difficulties. So, these emotions are also present in us. They also create a challenge in the process of uh, experiencing happiness. In today's world, there are certain things which are happening in our environment, at our workplace, in family life and they are creating a challenge and we need to recognize those factors. Today, with availability of various gadgets like mobile and iPod, iPad and other kinds of gadgets which have created more free time and the arrangements which are now possible to work from different places. Now, work from home has become a, a major strategy. Uh, there is also a possibility that uh, you are present at any place and you relate to office and to other individuals. You have uh, effective communication of that kind that provides freedom. The challenges of uh, uh, time and space, uh, 
have taken a different shade in today's uh, more effective transportation and uh, communication facilities. So, that has created a kind of imbalance between work and leisure. Lifestyle related problems are there, just to mention a few of them, the kind of diet, the physical activity, the possibilities of recreation, change in sleep pattern, all of them are contributing to the situation which goes against happiness and well being at physical level as well as psychological level. There is another important development and that considers consumption as index of development. Those who consume more are considered more developed, but with consumption there are many difficulties. It also leads to wastage and it also creates a condition where there is a gap and it also leads to increase in the needs. Uh, if you just attend the advertisements on TV, you will notice that there are many needs which are added to our list every day. The different advertisements offer various kinds of uh, gadgets, various kinds of uh, engagements and it is very difficult to uh, deny them, because they are presented in very interactive and very interesting ways. Competition, individualism and egoism are present in our life and this point has been elaborated earlier. So, we will not go into the details of that, but they definitely contribute to the way we organize our life. There are many problems which are introduced because of the technology and uh, if we analyze, we will see that the technology has become so important that human interaction has become mediated by technology. We also notice that technology is changing the habits of mind. What we remember and what we do not like to remember, all these things are being redistributed across various gadgets and I think that uh, learning habits are changing, writing habits are changing. Now, uh, laptop and mobile, they mediate our activities. Some of my friends say that they cannot write if they do not sit with their laptop. The creativity starts the moment they view the uh, laptop or the keyboard, then they start thinking. Modern medicine and health related interventions, which are uh, becoming quite variegated. There are uh, ways of cosmetic surgery, the way one wants to present oneself to society, there are ways in which one can achieve the color of body. We know about Michael Jackson, who shared one image with the people, which was very different than the real image. Similarly, now there are changes in the ways of uh, appearance and, and it has become very uh, important medical intervention. So, things are changing very fast. Lack of health related support system, this is uh, another major consideration and this point I have brought out here, because uh, in countries where uh, economic development is uneven, we find that access to health facilities is becoming a big challenge. In India, we find that gradually the health system is being privatized and the government support is becoming uh, limited and 
the effectiveness of government hospitals is being reduced. Now, this is creating a big challenge and uh, health and well-being are interrelated and if we do not provide sufficient health support, then it is going to influence the level of participation, activity and well-being of the people. There is one insight that has come from recent studies in psychology and that deals with the consequences of experiencing positive emotions like love, wisdom, gratefulness, forgiveness, humility and other related kind of experiences. It is uh, very interesting to note that uh, our understanding of anger, fear has a very long history and very detailed analysis has been done. The understanding of positive emotions is relatively new and current researches indicate that positive emotions contribute in significant ways in creating the possibilities for well-being and living life more effectively. Let us see what are the major contributions of positive emotions. The first uh, significant learning in the context of positive emotions is that positive emotions signal optimal functioning and they contribute to psychological growth and improved well-being. This is uh, something very uh, critical. It is critical in the sense that when you are for instance happy or when you smile, that smile or happiness indicates that your health is good, your functioning is effective, but the most important thing is that the experience of present happiness or smiling contributes to your further development. It is a guarantee that you will remain happy and you will become well being. So, if you increase the account of happiness, you are ensuring your future happiness, you are ensuring your well being for future. So, this is an important learning that how to create such occasions and how to regulate the active involvement of an individual in terms of experiencing wellness and happiness. Then there is another important observation, this deals with the contribution of positive emotion in terms of providing energy, providing opportunities to engage in behaviors, sustain behavior. So, if you are interested in some activity, then you are going to persist and then you are going to contribute in that particular area. This uh, hypothesis is something uh, great that when you are happy or when you experience positive emotions, then it leads to broadening of thought action repertoire that many good ideas will occur to you and you will be able to choose different kinds of actions. It motivates you to think in new ways, in creative ways. Then there is another important component that it is not only that your thoughts and your activities are going to be more variegated, but engaging in positive emotions also removes the effect of negative emotions. And there is one more corollary of uh, this kind of assertion that it has a spiral. The, the effect is that it continues. So, if you are happy, it is going to increase your thought pattern and action tendencies and this will again lead to positive emotions. 
so it will continue it will it will it will create such kind of continuous pattern in life positive emotions fuel psychological resilience and build personal resources and in many situations experiencing positive emotions provides various kinds of resources in in life so that you go for different kinds of options and create opportunities for yourself the indian perspective particularly the yoga system offers some methods to organize our emotional life in everyday life we meet people of different kinds and we have to relate to them there are occasions when we have to respond positively or negatively here is a prescription to organize our life in relation to different kind of people this uh, system says that one should experience bliss in this world by nurturing friendship with good people having compassion having pleasant behavior and if someone is negative someone is not helping you can do avoidance you can go for upeksha so these are very interesting ways to relate to people you can uh, relate positively or you can engage in a relationship where you maintain a distance so it is it is important to be uh, wise in terms of relating to individuals and organizing relationship in terms of different kinds of emotional tendencies now i i wanted to emphasize that handling emotion in terms of relationship with other individuals is a challenge where you regulate your behavior through uh, developing friendship or having compassion or having a uh, pleasant uh, behavior or avoiding but it also relates to the cognitive functioning the yoga system also says that it is crucial to recognize that you are in a position to control your cognitive activities how you relate and how you not relate the attention can be regulated and at meta cognitive level the chitta vrittis or fluctuation of mind need to be regulated so it is it is not only the emotional component but it is also the cognitive component in other words the cognitive appraisal is also very crucial how you attend to certain inputs how you attend to the behavior of other individual is also critically involved in relating to others by controlling one's cognition and regulating emotions one can live a life where emotions don't become burden where cognitions don't create challenges which are contrary to the needs of growth of an individual now that creates a situation if one develops such state of affair affairs in life then perhaps the person becomes jivan mukta or liberated in life the twin goals of regulating emotions and cognitions are going to contribute to strengthening immune system increasing resilience and providing a basis for an expanded notion of self it contributes towards enhancement of life energy to uh, meet challenges of life it also helps controlling the senses by the mind and in that way one can create an agenda for life where 
the activities are, are organized in terms of broader goals and involvement without attachment is one such strategy which has been proposed. Now, uh, what is the relevance of this yogic idea? The yogic idea is that you are the master of your own life. You are able to consider yourself a person who is in charge of life circumstances. If one is able to realize the limitations as well as potentials, if one is able to see that the true nature is something which is not associated with the worldly objects which are very temporary, which move, which come, which go, then perhaps a different kind of individual will emerge. Jivan Mukta is a notion which is in some sense ideal. It is ideal because it provides a state of detachment and also a state of involvement. It is not merely that one has to leave this world and then experience moksha or such a situation which is called liberation, but one can live a life like a liberated being and the liberated being is one who is autonomous and which organizes the uh, actions according to a balanced uh, mode of functioning. The analysis of uh, subjective well-being and happiness and wellness has been focusing largely at the individual level and a person who is high on subjective well-being is one who has self-acceptance, experiences personal growth, has purpose in life, goes for environmental mastery, autonomy and maintains positive relations with others. But this is an incomplete picture. It is incomplete in the sense that it deals with only at personal, deals with only personal well-being. There is also an important component which deals with social well-being and only recently attention has been paid to understanding and incorporating social well-being also as an agenda for understanding well-being in totality. So, social acceptance, social actualization, social contribution, social coherence and social integration are also equally valuable and important. Here, I would like to uh, refer to an interesting notion which Alfred Adler has uh, proposed and that is about social interest. That it is important to see and recognize that human life is maintained by others. And if one wants to grow and develop, one must have social interest and do activities relate to other individuals, contribute to the growth of community. These are equally valuable engagements for a life which is full of happiness and well-being. So, there should be an emphasis not only on uh, personal uh, aspirations or personal achievements or having a state of happiness at individual level, but individual happiness is not possible if we are not attending to the happiness at societal level. I mean, one can see how people uh, do things for their personal growth and they forget about the society. Uh, if you go into the details, corruption will become one example where this kind of imbalance is present. Now, there is uh, another development that has taken place. We have a lot of information about the various personality traits 
we have a lot of information of about various kinds of psychological disorders. We have uh, a manual developed to understand the various kinds of disorders and that has gone into many editions, lot of research is there. But there has not been enough effort to examine what are the positive qualities, what are the human strengths. Here there is an analysis which talks about the various character strengths. I have listed it, it has been developed by Peterson and Seligman on the basis of various kinds of input examining the texts uh, across various traditions, the studies that have been done as well as speculation. Now, they are engaged in developing measures for this. As you can see, wisdom and knowledge is one, courage, humanity, justice, temperance and then transcendence. Now, these six are considered as important character strengths and they can be measured. You will also recognize that they cover concerns at individual life, they cover concerns pertaining to social life and they also go beyond that, uh, not only in the individual and community, but going to a higher level to uh, think about the uh, nature, to think about environment and to have transcendence. So, positive development is an important agenda and this agenda has to be pursued through continuous effort. One question which comes to my mind and to researchers that can we increase happiness and how happiness can be achieved. There is an interesting insight from uh, some researchers. They have introduced a term flourishing and we find that flourishing involves growth, goodness, resilience and generativity. Happiness as a process leads to growth of individual as well as society and the various institutions which are present in any society help to organize life in such a way that people achieve their goals and they reach to a condition which is termed as flourishing. To be more specific, flourishing includes growth, goodness, resilience and generativity. Growth and goodness and resilience and generativity are interrelated and one has to see how they can be permitted, how conditions can be created in parenting, in schooling, in organizational setup, in political sphere that these goals are realized. It has been observed that there are two major dimensions, wellness and illness and there are combinations, there are different degrees of experiencing illness and wellness. The level where there is very low illness or illness is absent and wellness is very high, you have the condition of flourishing. There is a condition where there is an effort to have wellness, but there is also a condition which promotes illness, then there is struggling. A condition where there is high illness and there is low wellness that is floundering and one where is very low illness and also a low level of wellness, then there is languishing. Now, these are the patterns which may be seen in various societies or communities. 
an effort should be made to move towards the condition of flourishing. The question is that how sustainable happiness, how flourishing can be maintained, how flourishing can be achieved. What we have learned from uh, literature, what we have learned from learning from, uh, what we have learned from uh, different insights in different traditions is summarized here. Perhaps the first important learning is that fostering positive emotions, pleasure, engagement and meaning, they, they, they provide a condition where happiness can be achieved. So, the work should be one which promotes engagement, which is meaningful, can be one way to intervene to enhance happiness. People make a distinction between pleasant life, where you have sensory pleasure, gaining what you desire, good life, which includes attitude towards life as well as concern for society and then meaningful life, where you are able to uh, pursue the goals that you want and search for meaning is complete. And if there is pleasantness, if there is positiveness and if there is meaning, then you really have full life. But, but how this can be achieved? Kautilya in Arthashastra mentions that happiness is rooted in dharma. Sukhasya mulam dharma. That is, if you live in a society, if you create conditions in society, where dharma is maintained, that is, there is order, people respect life, people relate to others positively. If they try to follow the oft quoted principle of sarve bhavantu sukhina, perhaps that is the situation when there is dharma and then there will be happiness. And Rand says the same thing. Happiness is that state of consciousness, which proceeds from the achievement of one's values. So, bringing in value in the center of life at individual as societal level is key to happiness. Positive functioning and positive feelings both are reciprocally related. Flourishing individuals have enthusiasm for life and they are actively and productively engaged with others and in social institutions. The point which I want to emphasize is that mere materialistic concern following a life in relation to the goal of consumption is one which goes against happiness. One needs to give space to others one needs to learn relate, relating to others and societal goals. If both flourish, only then an individual can flourish and society can flourish. Uh, one of the important uh, studies and uh, a researcher, Sojna Lumrowski, has tried to integrate the literature and create a model which he calls architecture of sustainable change, which leads to happiness, makes an interesting observation. The observation is that there is a set point which is genetically determined and that contributes to 50 percent of happiness to one's life. The circumstances in life contribute 10 percent but 40 percent is contributed by the intentional activity of an individual. So, if you go for exercise, if you do social work, if you contribute to the growth of various institutions, you are going to contribute to development, you are going to contribute to happiness. So, happiness can be enhanced 
and intentional activity is something which is quite important and central and it matters that how we organize our life. So, we are the master of our life. If we think that these are the courses of action, if we engage in them with the pursuit of values, then we can be happy. Well-being cannot be considered as a state and we reach to that state, perhaps it is a process of striving and behaving, which helps gaining stability through persistent effort to obtain equilibrium in the midst of continuous change. Life is difficult, life always changes and maintaining an equilibrium is the challenge. It is only through a creative process of self-renovation and seeking harmony with others that one may move forward on this unending path of self-discovery. Happiness and well-being really relate to a process of self-discovery and that requires continuous introspection, regulation of self and making decisions and pursuing that. It is a tough demand, but if you want to remain happy and if you want to see that society is flourishing, we need to make such decisions to organize our life. I think this requires attention of parents, uh, schools and other organizations which are central to organizing life at different levels. In conclusion, I would like to draw attention to the changes that have taken in Indian society. If you recollect, Indians were of the view that there should be a concern for well-being of everybody at physical level as well as psychological level. As we remember, the oft quoted Sanskrit verse says, Sarve bhavantu sukhina, Sarve santu niramaya, Sarve bhadraani parshyantu, ma kashyad dukh bhag bhavet. Now, here is a desire to see that everyone is happy and this provided an extended scope to deliberate in life, which is very inclusive. And also, there has been emphasis on learning from miseries, suffering as well as trying to achieve higher goals. In today's world, with the emphasis on materialism, industrialization and globalization, there is more and more emphasis on material gain, having all the gadgets, trying to have more money and the consequence that we are facing is that there is increase in frustration, there is violence at domestic level, violence at group level, violence at the level of community. Now, one has to rethink about the premises that are there in the context of globalization. Is it necessary that we should follow a pattern of life which has led to problems in the developed countries? Uh, we have reached to a point where the society has to decide about the path that has to be followed, whether that path is one which leads to technological development, increasing frustration and increasing pathology or one where there is a balanced, balanced development, societal growth and well-being of everyone. I think it is important to nurture an orientation which recognizes 
higher values and creates a balance in supplying things, in getting things. And I am reminded of Gandhi ji, who mentioned that the environment, the nature has enough to provide everybody, but it cannot fulfill the greed and that is an important lesson. As a society, we have to attend to the conditions in which we live and the goals that are good for society. Instead of emulating what is happening in other places and moving in the same direction, it is necessary that, that we critically examine the goals and values which are relevant and perhaps relevant to the entire universe. Materialism has led us to think that more is better and one should try to achieve more and more. Indian thought has emphasized on a notion which recognizes the value of contentment. Santosh is a term which has great significance in Indian thought and there is an emphasis on recognizing the limitations and enjoying what one has and what can be achieved has to be regulated in terms of what is the conditions in which people live. So, a balanced approach is necessary having a desire to have experience of contentment is one which is emphasized in bhakti tradition by Kabir and many others. So, it is part of life. People who are poor do have experience of happiness. People who have limited resources also experience wellness. We need to see this very important fact that the entire world is full of various things. Desires can be as high as one can think and imagine, but that is not the way to organize life. It will lead to more and more frustration. If we increase the range of our desires, as Bhagavad Gita says that these desires once fulfilled again take place, they re-emerge and there is no end to that. I think almost all Indian traditions emphasize this point that there should be certain degree of satisfaction in the organization of life activities and that comes only when there is contentment or santosh. This is an important insight and if we recognize the uh, conditions, the population, the resources and availability of opportunities and distribution of income, the challenge of equity, one has to recognize that santosh too is important. It does not mean that one should not make effort, but it is important to recognize the limits within which one has to work. Thank you very much.